Okay. Well, as I said, today we're still in Matthew. I'm just going to continue where I've been teaching in Matthew's Gospel. This is section 6 of Matthew according to the outline that I've made for his book. And I've titled this section, Jesus Pronounces Judgment Against Israel and Its Leaders because much of this section is going to come around or be related to these uh, declarations of judgment that Jesus does make while he's in Jerusalem there toward the end of his earthly ministry. Now we're currently in a portion of section 6, which is characterized by a confrontation between Jesus and the leaders of the Jews, in which Jesus tells three parables. So this uh, confrontation is between primarily we see the chief priests and the elders show up. Uh, seems like others show up later, but mainly what we've seen so far is the chief priest and the elders. And Jesus addresses them uh, eventually with three parables. And I've titled this portion, The Leaders of the Kingdom Lose the Kingdom, because I believe that summarizes well what those parables are actually trying to do and what really some of the things before those parables are also trying to do. So that is a form of judgment if you want to connect that to section 6. The leaders of the kingdom lose the kingdom, referring to those leaders of Israel at the time of Jesus. As of today, we have finally made it to the first of these three parables, which is our passage for today. So again, that passage is Matthew 21, starting in verse 28 reading through verse 32, which I'll read here in a moment. This is commonly known as the parable of the two sons, or you might say parable of the two children. And on that note, I want to direct your uh, attention to a marginal note that the NASB has, uh, just because the way I'm going to be reading the passage reflects what's in that marginal note. If you're using the NASB, you'll see that in the very first verse, uh, there are these marginal notes saying that children uh, might be the an alternative translation there instead of sons. I actually think that is more accurate, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But just for the sake of accuracy, that's how I'm going to read it, unless I make a mistake in the course of teaching. But uh, I'm going to read it as children rather than sons, just because I think that's a bit more precise. But let's go ahead and read that passage, again starting in verse 28. So Jesus, again speaking to the chief priests and the elders, and after he uh, kind of shames them in uh, refusing, rightfully refusing to answer their question about his authority in all of this, he says, but what do you think a man had two children? And he came to the first and said, child, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. So based on this passage, I am giving this sermon a title that is based on the title that I have for this whole portion, which is the leaders of the kingdom lose the kingdom. All of these parables are some variation of that idea. The leaders of the kingdom lose the kingdom. This parable, my uh, title for this sermon on this parable, is the leaders of the kingdom lose rank in the kingdom. So this is one of the several ways we're going to see them lose the kingdom, so to speak. In this case, it's a matter of losing rank in the kingdom. And through this parable, Jesus teaches that for the children of the kingdom, repentance and faith will outrank profession and prestige. And there are quite a few words there that I will explain to those of you younger people who still need help learning some of your words. The only one I want to explain right now is this idea of outranking. So basically it means to be more important or to uh, have more importance to it. So in this case, what I'm saying is repentance and faith 
outrank prestige or profession, meaning they're more important than those things, or more important than anything else, really. So that's what I mean by outranking, when I speak of repentance and faith, outranking prestige and profession. Now my outline for this sermon has four divisions, which I will give to you now for your, to help you as you listen to the sermon. First of all, Jesus tells a parable about two kinds of children and about repentance and faith. And really that first division is really to cover some basic matters of the parable, just to get them out of the way. Secondly, these two kinds of children and the real people they represent are marked by very different virtues. As it turns out, both of these children in the parable have their own kind of virtue, and it's just a matter of contrasting the two. So that's what I'll do in that second division. Thirdly, in the kingdom of God, the wrong children are honored. And I say it that way because that is exactly how this parable would have seemed to anyone who heard it there first when Jesus first taught this parable, that the wrong children receive honor by the end of this, uh, this teaching of Jesus. And then finally, for my fourth division, God greatly honors repentance and faith, which is the great uh, application and lesson that we should all learn from this, how greatly God will honor repentance and faith. Now, as we talk about this first parable of the three parables, I want to give you an assessment of what all three of them are actually doing. All three of them are in some sense talking about reversal, as to say a kind of switch that takes place in the kingdom of God. Now, to explain that, and maybe to help the children understand what I mean by reversal, you know, I might refer to a Bible story more familiar to you all. You have David and Goliath. You look at that uh, battle there, between da that fight between David and Goliath. And as you look at that, you know, who do you think would normally win this fight? You, know, you have really big, strong guy versus little boy David. Who would normally win that kind of fight? What do you think? Anyone afraid to say it? Goliath, you, the guy, you, your money would be on Goliath if you were betting on this, right? You'd say, well, Goliath, surely he'll win. But of course, God gives David that victory. You know, the little shepherd boy, the young man who has never really been to war in his life, actually won that fight. And that is a kind of reversal. And that's what I mean in the sense that in the kingdom of God, God loves to take people who ordinarily would not have any advantage, would not have any uh, reason to be favored or anything like that. God loves to give them first place and takes everyone else down several notches. He, in this case, David, you might say, outranks Goliath or outclasses him. And that is the kind of reversal I'm talking about. In these parables that Jesus tells to these leaders of Israel, they all feature some kind of reversal in which the leaders of Israel end up on the bottom and somebody else ends up on top in terms of the kingdom of heaven. So all of these feature some kind of reversal, including this one about these two children, which is our parable for today. And I'll go ahead and start with my first major division of my sermon on this parable, which is just to say that Jesus tells a parable about two kinds of children and about repentance and faith. And mainly this first division of my sermon is just to establish some very basic points which need to be in place before we get into the real matter of the passage. So all these are very foundational, but I want to make sure we're understanding all these things. First things first, yes, this is indeed a parable. And I'm sure many of you would have called it that, but I wanted to make it clear that this is something that Jesus himself would refer to as a parable. And we know that because Jesus himself actually does call it that. He doesn't call it that here in this passage. He doesn't, he doesn't introduce it by saying, here is a parable. But if you keep reading on into the next passage, he actually does refer back to this as a parable. If you jump down to verse 33, he, as he goes on to his second parable, he says, listen to another parable. And of course, if he says this is another parable, there must have been a parable before that one. And so, yes, this story about the two sons and the lesson from it, this is a parable. So, 
I just wanted to say that if you wonder why I'm calling it a parable, well, Jesus did. So yes, this is a parable. So that very simply stated, I just wanted to say that for uh, to get it out of the way here. Second thing, this is something I promised I would talk about at the very beginning, just the idea that this parable is about two children. And I do mean to use the word children rather than sons because I do think that is more accurate. I think the, the marginal note that you have if you're using the New American Standard Bible is a bit more accurate. And my reason for saying that is just that Matthew does not use the perfectly good Greek word for son. There's a perfectly good word for that. Quios is how they say son in Greek. And Matthew doesn't use that word. He doesn't use the word for son. Instead, he uses this word which refers to neither a male nor a female, so neither a boy nor a girl, neither a man nor a woman, but just a word that could refer to either. He uses the word technon, which normally just means child. So it doesn't refer to a child of either sex or gender, just uh, could be either of them. And just to be clear, uh, furthermore, and this might be why some Bible translations don't necessarily like using this word, but uh, child or technon, to go back to the Greek, does not necessarily refer to a youth. It's not necessarily a young person or a small person. Uh, for that, Matthew could have used another Greek word, pais or paideon, which refers to really young people or little people. Uh, the word used by Matthew, technon, means anyone that has a parent. If you have a mother and father, you are a technon, you are a child. And to that degree, you know, everyone in this room is a technon. A 75-year-old woman can be a technon just because she has parents. So it's that kind of word. It's just a very generic word referring to anyone that has parents. Now, you might wonder, having brought this up twice now and actually given an argument for it, does this actually matter for understanding the passage? Honestly, it may not matter too much. Some of this is just my desire to be accurate with these things. It might make some sense, however, with what Matthew is doing in this parable, the way he has written it here, uh, because as we go on with this parable, you find out that at least one of these children represents prostitutes, among other people. And you know, prostitutes, of course, are women. They are grown women. So maybe he thought the word son would be out of place in referring to that. Maybe he decided to use the word child to be more inclusive of those women that are, you know, in some sense, the referent of this parable. So maybe that's why he used it. Maybe he was just feeling like using that word that day. It may not matter too much, but that's my best guess as to why he used the word uh, technon or child rather than son. But that is just to explain why I'm using the word children and why I think it might matter. This next introductory point, though, is quite more important than the others, and this is a matter of making sure we understand these two very key words that I'm using here, and that is repentance and faith. These words are certainly important. If you've been sort of uh, lulled to sleep by the first two basic points I wanted to make, this should be very much worthy of your attention. Let's talk about what these words mean. We'll start with repentance to make sure we all understand this word well. I mean by repentance that a person begins to have such a great hatred of sin that he begins to do good instead. So such a hatred of sin that now this person begins to do good instead of the sin he used to do. And this, of course, is a lesson that I especially want the younger people among us to know who are still learning about these things and who may yet to have actually repented of their sins. I want you to understand what this word means for sure. So first of all, it is not enough simply to hate sin. It can be very easy to hate sin, especially when you feel the guilt associated with it and the, things that, the bad things that happen to you because of the bad things you have done. It's not enough just to hate sin. You actually have to hate it enough that you result in wanting to do good instead and actually doing good instead. It has to be that kind of hatred that actually causes a change. And on that note, also directed to the same uh, young people in front of me now, it's not enough actually to do good. It's not enough to hear about all these good things you ought to be doing because your parents or your pastors tell you to do them you actually have to want to do those things because you don't like sin anymore. You actually have to love what is good and therefore do what is good. 
And all of those things together are repentance. It is a hatred of sin that is great enough that it actually causes you to change the way you act and start doing good instead of sin. So that is repentance. And very important to remember what that word means. Here's the next word, faith. Here's one that uh, I might give you kids or you young people out there a chance to say this. How would you define faith? What would you say faith is? It's a big one. So big you're, okay, we have a, we have a courageous person here. Go ahead, Esther. Trusting in, God. Trusting in God. Very good. That is basically what faith is. And I want to add a little bit more to that. And I think this is something that has been uh, taught in some of your earlier kids' lessons that we do on Wednesday nights here. I want to say that it's trusting God so much or believing God so much that you do as he says, that you actually listen to God and that whatever he tells you to do, you actually do it. Which would mean that anyone who says he has faith but does not actually live as a person who does what God says and cares about what God says, that person actually has no faith, even though he says he has faith. So it's a, it's a kind of trust in God that's great enough within you that makes you actually want to do as God says. And of course, meanwhile, same point as with repentance. It doesn't matter to actually do those good things for other reasons. You actually have to do them because you're trusting in the Lord about what he says about those good things and why you should do them. So again, there's that same relationship with faith as there is with repentance. It's important that these any good thing that is done, anything done in obedience to the Lord, comes from a heart that actually trusts the Lord and does hate sin. So all of that under repentance and faith. So repentance is being the hatred of sin that is so great that makes you change your ways and do good instead. But also faith being trusting in God so much and believing in God so much that you actually do as he says. So all of that is certainly important for understanding this parable and for understanding the gospel. So all of that to say that this parable here is about these two children, and through these two children we're going to learn about repentance and faith. So that brings us to my second division for this uh, sermon today. And this brings us into the real business of the parable. These two kinds of children and the real people they represent are marked by very different virtues, meaning there are Things that can be said about them that are good, uh, so that's what I mean by virtues. There are things that can be said about uh, both groups of people that are good, but they're very different in what good things they have to say about them. So that's what we're talking about in this division here. Now, I've also told you, just to refer back to the past, I'm kind of squirming around here because my right leg is acting up a little bit. <clears throat> Unfortunate side effect of what I did to it. Uh, but anyway, I've told you in the past that these parables of Jesus usually have a surprise to them. Uh, there's very often a good uh, point to look for that surprise. And this parable contains two surprises, one for each child. And we'll see one of those surprises here as we talk about the different virtues of these children. Let's read the parable again. Jesus says, but what do you think? A man had two children. And he came to the first and said, Child, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward, so as to believe him. So let's talk about both children and the groups of people that are represented by those children. We'll start with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, who are represented by the first child. That first child is the one that said he would not go and work in the vineyard, like his father said, but then decided he wanted to anyway, and then went and went to work in the vineyard. So that child, that first child, represents the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Now, I will sometimes refer to the tax collectors and the prostitutes simply as the sinners, because they were. They were sinners. These were people that 
spent their time doing evil things. So sometimes when I just say the sinners, I mean the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Now a tax collector is certainly going to have a bad reputation in much the same way that the modern day IRS would have a bad reputation. And I'm saying that on video for the record, just to let the man know I don't care. Uh, a tax collector is going to have a very bad reputation because they collect taxes. For those of you children who have not yet paid taxes or learned what those are, taxes are, this is money that we pay to powerful people in the hope that they will use that money for the good of everyone. Doesn't always turn out that way, but we always hope that it will. And so these tax collectors are taking money from us, from people, to give to the powerful people to do things with it that hopefully will turn out well. So generally you got a person who's taking your money away from you. That usually leads to a bad reputation as it is. And of course in Israel that would have been the same way. But in Israel there were other features of being a tax collector that were bad. They were collecting taxes for the Roman government. So not even for their own nation, but for this other nation that had taken over their nation. So a lot of Jews viewed these tax collectors as being traitors to their own country, people that you know, lacked loyalty to their own country. So there is a bad mark against them. Also, these tax collectors very often used their influence to take more money than they should have. They would have used their, uh, their office as tax collectors to take more than they should have from you. And so they really are a kind of thief at the same time. So for all those reasons, because they're traitors and thieves and generally taking their money, your money away from you, but mainly because of their traitorous nature and their, their tendency to steal, for those reasons, mainly, uh, these tax collectors are to be called sinners. These are sinful men. And then we have the other class of people, the prostitutes. Now, if you know what a prostitute is, then you already know why she is a sinner. I don't have to explain that to you. If you don't know what a prostitute is, you'll maybe have to wait until you're older or maybe ask your parents to explain that to you if they are willing to do so. Uh, otherwise, you may just have to wait to hear about that a little later on in life. But if you knew what a prostitute was and what she does, um, you would realize immediately that she too is a sinner. So these tax collectors and these prostitutes are very much sinful people. They are sinners and viewed that way by everyone. Now here is the surprise. One of the surprises in this parable, these sinners actually have some virtue that can be praised about them, and that is this. They have responded to the preaching of John the Baptist in particular. They have responded with repentance and faith. So even after a lifetime of wickedness, they now have these virtues that we can say about them. They have repentance and faith. These sinful people, first of all, actually repented. And we can see that this is pictured in the parable here, the way the first child responds to his father. You know, his father says to him, child, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. He started to feel a pang of guilt there and said, ah, I don't like that I said that. I'm going to go work like my father said. So there is repentance there. At first, he disobeyed, just as the tax collectors and uh, the prostitutes spent their lives in sin, but then afterwards repented at the preaching of John. So there's that repentance there. And you also see later on that they have faith. You see here in verse 32, uh, it says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. So you see them also responding in faith. They acknowledge that this man, John, is a prophet of God. They're going to believe God and do what God says through this prophet. So they have faith as well. So as surprising as all this is, these tax collectors and prostitutes, represented by the first child in this parable, actually are marked by some virtue. They have repentance and faith. So after their lifetime of sinning, they have that much that can be said about them. They repented and believed at the preaching of John. Meanwhile, there is another child mentioned in this parable who represents the other group of people, the group of people to whom Jesus is actually talking right now, the chief priests and the elders, the leaders of Israel, who are represented by this second child. Now these chief priests and these elders are marked by a very different set of virtues. And you might call them profession and prestige. 
Now, a profession is simply what they do with their time. There are different ways we can use that word, but I'm using it in the sense of what they do with their time. Now, <clears throat> what you see here in this parable, this second child says that he will go work in the vineyard and then does not. Okay, so he turns out to be somewhat double-tongued in that regard. But he says he's going to go, right? So he has at least the appearance of being obedient. And that is a pretty good representation of these priests and elders, especially the priests, because these priests are in a profession in which it really looks like they're serving God. I mean, these are priests. These are people descended from Aaron, whose job it is to manage the temple of God and offer sacrifices and intercede for the people with God. They have this, possess they have this profession from birth. They're born into it. You know, they have to grow up before they can actually join the priest there in the temple. But from birth, they know what they're going to do with their life. They are priests. They have this profession that seems like a very godly profession. Compared to a tax collector or a prostitute, there is no contest. These priests have a very godly looking profession. It very much looks like they're serving God. But we also have this other matter, this matter of prestige. You know, prestige is the respect that people have for you because of something you've done or something you are. You know, it describes people who other people, uh, they consider them worthy of honor. So prestige, certainly these priests and these elders have prestige. These priests have prestige from birth. The elders are people that have become so influential or so wealthy or in some sense so honored among the people there in Jerusalem that they have earned a seat on the Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin. So they certainly have prestige. I mean, yeah, these men are very prestigious. They did something to get that kind of prestige. And it's no small thing. And of course, they're going to have a lot more prestige than these tax collectors who are viewed as traitors and thieves and a lot more prestige than these prostitutes. So as we look at these, uh, these uh, chief priests and these elders, they have something about them that you could say good about them. They have a godly profession. They have prestige in the eyes of people. Those are things you might consider virtuous. In contrast to these repentant sinners, these tax collectors, and these prostitutes, they have a different set of virtues. Now those observations serve only one purpose, and this brings me into my third division for today's sermon, by the way. One purpose here in saying all of this, Jesus, according to this parable that he tells, says that in the kingdom of God, the wrong children receive honor. The wrong children come out on top in the kingdom of God. They outrank everyone else, the wrong children. This is the second of the two great surprises that I mentioned to you coming in this parable. This great surprise that the wrong children receive honor. Let's read the parable again. This time you can focus on the idea of the wrong children receiving honor. It says, but what do you think? A man had two children. And he came to the first and said, child, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. The first child did the will of his father. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you, before you priests and elders, right? Because that's who Jesus is speaking to at this moment. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. Now I have said that the wrong children are honored and that this is a principle Jesus gives us for the kingdom of heaven. According to the way most religious people think, you know, not speaking necessarily of Christians, but just religious people in general, a lifetime spent in a godly profession or with rightful prestige, should outrank by far any kind of newfound repentance from a lifetime of wickedness, right? You know, it's like, okay, yeah, it's good that they repent and believe now, but I've been doing this for years. You know, I've been doing this all my life. You know, this is surely I matter more than these other people. 
That is a very common way of thinking among religious people. Instead, Jesus teaches that for the children of the kingdom, repentance and faith will outrank profession and prestige. So if you have the godly profession and the prestige among all the other religious people, that just puts you down here. If you have repentance and faith, that puts you up here in the kingdom. You need to raise those higher because I got the stand in front of me, but you're going to be outranked by those with repentance and faith. And if you have repentance and faith, you receive the highest rank in the kingdom of heaven. And so, in the thinking of most religious people, the Jews standing there in the temple on that day, uh, the way they would have viewed this, you know, they were very much religious people in themselves, the way those uh, Jews and those Jewish leaders in particular would have viewed this, they would have seen it as the wrong children receiving honor. You know, the priests and the elders would have said, hey, I'm a priest, I'm an elder, surely that's worth something. And Jesus says, that's worth this much, repentance and faith is worth way up here. So they, are, they have been outranked by these people whom they would have considered of no mention whatsoever in the kingdom. According to Jesus, the wrong children receive honor. That's how this would have been viewed by those hearing this parable when Jesus told it. Now, the honor given to these repentant sinners is described like this. They enter the kingdom before the men who should have led Israel into the kingdom. So they enter, the, these repentant sinners enter the kingdom before the men who should have led Israel into the kingdom. And I am basing this mainly off of the last third of verse 31. If you go there to the last thing Jesus says in verse 31, he says, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. So that's how he words this. They get into the kingdom before these priests and these elders. Now the way Jesus words his response some people have understood him to mean that the priests and the elders actually do enter the kingdom of God just later than the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Which is to say, the way most people read it, they have a very hopeful and optimistic way of reading this verse, that the chief priests and the elders also receive salvation, they just get it later on. I do not think that is what Jesus means by this, not by a long shot. I don't think that entering before necessarily means that someone else enters after. There are some situations, if you want to think of it this way, in which there's no prize for second place, and you, know, you snooze, you lose kind of thing. If you don't get in there first, you've lost everything. I think that's the kind of situation Jesus has in mind, where those who get into the kingdom first, they get the kingdom, and everyone else is left waiting outside. That's what it means when these repentant sinners enter before the priests and the elders. It means that the priests and the elders don't get a chance to get in there at all. They took too long, they lost their chance. Now, <clears throat> there is a parable Jesus tells later on in Matthew that I think gives you the same basic idea, and it might be helpful to read that to you. So I'll go ahead and read that to you as well. This is in Matthew 25. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 1. This is the parable of the ten virgins. And here you see people who, you know, some people enter first, and after that no one else is allowed to enter. So you'll see what I mean as I read this. So Jesus says this, <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on alert then. 
for you do not know the day or the hour. Now that parable was told on a different occasion and for a different purpose, but I'm reading it to you because it shows you that in this parable, the wise, vir the wise virgins certainly entered the house before the others, but that doesn't mean the foolish virgins got in later. The foolish virgins got locked out. So one enters before, the other doesn't enter at all. And that, I think, is also the imagery here in Matthew 21. I do not have an optimistic reading of the verse with regard to the chief priests and the elders, not by any means. When the repentant sinners entered the kingdom before the Jewish leaders, the sinners filled the kingdom, leaving the leaders outside in the dark forever. They don't get in. That's what happens when the tax collectors and the prostitutes <coughs> enter the kingdom before the chief priests and the elders. And that is a terrible disgrace. It is a great dishonor for those chief priests and these elders. It's a great dishonor to them that they were so slow to embrace the way of righteousness that they lost their place in the kingdom. These are the leaders of Israel. These are the men who should have been leading the way into the kingdom. Instead, out of envy for Jesus and out of dislike for the things he was teaching and doing, and for a dislike of John the Baptist as well, for that matter, they just didn't get on board. They just did not enter the kingdom at the only time that was offered to them, and they lost their place to these other people who normally you would think, oh, they're not getting into the kingdom. They don't have a, they don't have a chance. But because of their repentance and their faith, they got in, and the guys with the godly profession and all the prestige got left out. It is a great disgrace for them. And that is how Jesus describes the honor given to these sinners who repent and believe, that they actually get in there, they sort of steal the place of these priests and these elders. The profession and the, and the prestige doesn't matter at all. Now that these have profession and faith, they're advanced to the top. They actually enter the kingdom, and they enter ahead of those people who would be expected to enter. <clears throat> that is the honor bestowed upon these wrong children, as I call them. You know, by worldly standards or by normal religious standards, these are not the people that would normally get the kingdom, but they're the only ones who get it, those who repent and believe. <clears throat> All right, in the final part of my sermon here, I just want to make sure you see how greatly God honors repentance and faith. These things, repentance and faith, these are big deals, and I have two ways to try to explain that further to you here at the end of this sermon. <coughs> For starters, this matter of repenting and believing is so highly honored by God that he honors it more than Jewish heritage and history. Okay, So more than all the history we see with the nation of Israel there in the Old Testament, God cares about repentance and faith more than he cares about the first three-fourths of your Bible, if you want to put it that way. Uh, now that may be a small thing to you because none of us have Jewish heritage, but it would have been no small thing to the readers of Matthew's gospel or to those who were listening to the teaching of Jesus there on the day that he told this parable. So I think first about Matthew. Do you realize that Matthew is the only one that actually records this parable? Mark did not think it was important enough to include. Luke did not think it was important enough to include. And John didn't either. But Matthew thought about this parable and said, yeah, this needs to go in my gospel. And he did that because apparently his own people, Matthew being the gospel written mostly to the Jews there in Israel, Matthew thought that his own people really needed to hear this, this teaching about faith and repentance and about the downfall of the chief priests and the elders for their lack of repentance and faith. The kingdom of God, think about it this way, the kingdom of God was first promised to Israel out of all the nations of the world. If you can imagine the entire world in pagan darkness with just one teeny tiny nation named Israel that has any kind of light from God whatsoever. That was the situation <clears throat> for most of history. You know, surely then in that ancient world, no greater honor could have been possessed by any nation than to have God working among you, God revealing himself among you, God dwelling among you, as God often put it, Surely there was a great honor there, and surely that honor would be worth something. And yet we see, and really we see this before the days of Jesus, but Jesus makes this same point, that not everyone in Israel will inherit 
all that God had promised that nation. Even though Israel is very much the chosen precious nation, not even all of them are going to get all these good things that God has promised. John the Baptist and then Jesus especially created a firm divide within that nation. They drew a line and said people on this side of the line, they're going to inherit these good things that God has promised our nation and these other people will not. And that line which divided the nation and which determined which half of the nation inherited the kingdom was faith and repentance. Faith and repentance were that line that John and Jesus drew for Israel and your fate depended on where you put yourself on one side of the line or the other. If anyone needed to learn that lesson, it was the Jews living in Israel who otherwise might have placed false hope in their pedigree. John the Baptist even talked about that. He said, do not say to yourselves, we're sons of Abraham. He said, God can raise up from these rocks sons for Abraham. That's nothing. What matters is repenting. And Jesus came along later and said the same thing, repent and believe in the gospel. Those are the things that matter. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't matter if God has favored your nation. What matters is whether you have repented and believed. So that is the high honor that God bestows on this. As, as special as it was for God to deal with Israel the way he did and to give them such great promises and such great prestige in the eyes of the world, none of that mattered compared to repentance and faith. So there's one way to see how greatly God honors those things. Now here's another way, and that is God honors repentance and faith more highly than he honors our own understanding of godliness. And I'm going to throw this back onto you here. Uh, God honors repentance and faith more highly than he honors your understanding of godliness. Maybe that's a better way to put it. So here dealing now with just the ideas and notions people have in their own minds about what it means to be godly and how God favors people and why God favors certain people. Now to us, you might say it is very common knowledge that Jesus honored repentant sinners more than the religious leaders of his day, more than those who had the right profession and all the prestige of his time and place. We would say that is common knowledge, especially among us Christians. The problem with common knowledge is that it leads to widespread ignorance, if you ask me. There's, a, there's such a thing as having this idea in your mind and it being so basic that you start to kind of forget it's there and you don't really apply it anymore. In that way, common knowledge can lead to widespread ignorance. And in this case, I think we become so familiar with the idea that it loses its power. Kind of like taking a medicine so often that it no longer affects you the way it should. It no longer helps you. Well, in this case, we're so familiar with the idea of Jesus being with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and spurning the religious leaders that now it doesn't really have the same effect on us as it did back in the days when Jesus was teaching these things. So to help you overcome that problem, I want to try as well as I can to force you to see just how jarring this would have been to those people listening to Christ back then as he told this parable. So for a moment, consider Chad and I, okay? We are the pastors of this church. We are your elders, okay? There's a reason you have us both up here teaching often. There's a reason that you submit to us in our leadership and with regard to this church. Now, just think about us then as pastors. You know, we have an office. We have godly professions, you might say, and we have some degree of prestige as pastors. Now imagine that you know another person whom you believe to be wise in the ways of God. If you want to imagine some particular person that comes to your mind, maybe someone wiser than Chad and I, I'm sure there are several that you can possibly think of for that. Just someone that you consider to be wise in the ways of God. Think about that person as well. And now imagine that the wise person told you that Chad and I were actually condemned and that God had a greater joy in sex workers and white collar criminals. Imagine that this wise person whom you trust, this person whom you consider wise in the ways of the Lord, told you that Chad and I were going to hell and that God had more, more joy in these prostitutes and these tax collectors over here, these sinners. Imagine that someone told you that. Frankly, you would not believe it. 
you would not believe that Chad and I are on the path to hell and that these other people that are just revolting to you are actually experiencing the favor of God. You just would not believe it at all. And if you can imagine such a situation unfolding in your own life, you can imagine the effect of this parable on the people who first heard it, who first heard the idea that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are getting into the kingdom while these elders and these priests are being left out. You could not have believed it. You've been trained from the very beginning of your life to view these men as being, in some sense, in God's special favor. These are the leaders of the holy nation. Surely that counts for something, doesn't it? Nope, doesn't count for anything. All that matters is repentance and faith. And if the tax collectors and the prostitutes have it, that's what matters. And if the leaders of Israel don't have it, that's what matters. This is the kind of thing that would have been tremendously shocking to those people to hear it. It might be old news for us, but for them, it would have left them at a loss for what to say. So I think it's very important for us to remember these things. In our own minds, we can have these same false notions about godliness. We can get it in our heads, well, yeah, surely so-and-so has God's favor because of this, this, and this. Surely so-and-so is loved by God because of this reason and this reason. We can easily think those things and just get away with ourselves and our own minds having these wrong notions. Very important to remember that even if you have these ideas about godliness and what it is, none of that actually matters compared to repentance and faith. Okay? The tax collector, the prostitute, whatever kind of vile sinner you can imagine, you know, fill in the blank, whoever you consider to be the worst of the worst. If that person repents and believes, that person goes straight up into the favor of God, into the kingdom of heaven, and anyone else who does not have repentance and faith is out, no matter what your views of godliness are. So be wary of yourself as you think of these things, and also remember the pride of place that God gives to those who repent and believe. That is literally the only thing he is looking for with this issue of who's getting into the door of the kingdom. You know, there are other passages where you know, we might give other details on that, but the way Jesus tells this right here, right now, it is repentance and faith. Those deserve pride of place in your mind because they have pride of place in God's mind. So the true lesson of this parable about the two children is this. If you do nothing else, if you have nothing else, practice repentance and faith and have repentance and faith. That is what God prizes most highly among people, and those are God's entrance requirements for his kingdom. And that's the only thing he's looking for. And if you try to bring anything else to the door, he's going to say, that doesn't matter. Only repentance and faith. Now I have said that section 6 of Matthew is characterized by Jesus pronouncing judgment on Israel and its leaders. This parable is perhaps the softest of the passages in this uh, section because there's no real direct judgment, although you do see uh, by implication these chief priests and these elders getting a very rude awakening about how and why they're being left out of God's kingdom and they can deduce in their own mind what their fate is based on that. Uh, meanwhile, we see some relief from all the heavy-handed judgmental things that uh, Christ might say because we see a glimpse of these people who actually make it into the kingdom, who are actually received by God as his children. It is these people uh, here represented in this parable by this first child, those who avoid judgment through their repentance and their faith. These people may be called the first children of the kingdom because they not only repent and believe before anyone else, but because they actually get into the kingdom first and ahead of everyone else at the point where they are now the, they are now the heirs of the kingdom. They got in the door first and now they possess the kingdom, and everyone else is left on the outside. So that is the main message of this parable, which I'll summarize for you here again at the very end. I said, first of all, that this is a parable, and this parable is about two kinds of children, and about the repentance and the faith of the uh, people that had responded to John and Jesus rightly. And then secondly, uh, Jesus says of these two kinds of children that they are uh, marked by very different virtues. They represent people who are marked by very different virtues. The first children have their repentance and their faith, and they represent the tax collectors and the prostitutes who repented and believed. 
And then the second child represents the uh, chief priests and the elders who have their profession and their prestige, which is somewhat virtuous in its own sense. But they receive a very uh, difficult wake-up call from Jesus because we find out that in the kingdom of God, the wrong children are honored, meaning that those with the godly profession and those with all the prestige are left out of the kingdom. And the ones who enter into the kingdom are those that have been practicing a lifetime of sin, but then repent and believe, like these tax collectors and like these prostitutes. And God bestows greater honor on them than on the leaders of Israel. And finally, God so greatly honors the repentance and faith of these first children of the kingdom that he honors it more than anything in Israel's history or heritage, and he honors it more than our own understanding of godliness, whatever that may be. God certainly puts repentance and faith at the top of your list of things that you need to do and things that you need to have. And in this way, Jesus teaches that the children of the kingdom, uh, for the children of the kingdom, repentance and faith will outrank profession and prestige. They're going to be more important. And meanwhile, the leaders of the kingdom actually lose rank in the kingdom for not having repentance and faith because they lost those things, because they didn't have those things they lost their rank in the kingdom, according to this parable told by Jesus. And this is, again, the first of three parables, which will all have a similar kind of reversal where we see something happen that you would not expect. And we'll pick up next time in the next of these two parables with the uh, parable of the vineyard and the vine growers, which is coming up next in Matthew. For now, are there any questions or comments on anything I said today?